Welcome back, everyone. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the speakers and moderators for our next panel entitled Cities and Art. Our panelists will be discussing large-scale arts programming such as biennales, triennales, and citywide events. In the wake of COVID-19, is there still room for such events? And if so, how? We're pleased to welcome moderator Mr. David Chu and speaker Ms. Shubigi Rao in person here today, dialing in from Japan, Australia and Indonesia respectively are Ms. Juliet Knapp, Ms. Emma O'Neill and Ms. Alia Swastika. Once again, if you have any questions for the panelists, please continue to submit them through the Pigeonhole Live website. The pigeonhole URL and event passcode will also be flashed during the panel session for your easy reference. Pigeonhole Live is an easy to use platform where you can submit your questions for the panel of speakers. If you have a smartphone or tablet with you, simply launch your internet browser and enter www.pigeonhole.at into the address bar. Next, key in our event passcode ArtSymp 2021, A-R-T-S-Y-M-P 2021. You will then see all the panels in this event. Please select the relevant panel, Cities and Art, and submit your questions. I'll now hand you over to your, our moderator, Mr. David Chu. David, please. Thanks, Pauline. Welcome everyone to this panel on cities and art, uh, really exploring large-scale arts programming in the age of the COVID pandemic. We hope to explore some learning points, I think, and challenges and possibilities for the future. Uh, and I would like to very quickly welcome today our very esteemed panelists. Um, we have Shubi Yirao, um, artist, writer, and artistic director of the Kochi Missouri Biennale, Emma O'Neill, festival director of Art Month Sydney, Alia Swastika, Curator and Director of the Georgia Biennale Foundation, and Juliet Knapp, Co-Director of the Kyoto Experiment. Welcome everyone. Uh, just before we begin, uh, just to guide the short one hour or so that we have, um, the format will be such that each speaker will get about five minutes uh, to introduce themselves, what they do, uh, and also some brief thoughts on the topic. Uh, today. Uh, all the full bios of the panelists are also online, so I will just very quickly briefly introduce everyone. Do see the, the full bios of uh, each panelist online if you want more information. Um, after that, we'll have a very healthy, I think, rest of the hour or so for a lively discussion uh, on some of your pertinent questions as well that you can please start submitting on the pigeonhole uh, if you want, relating to the topic. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, Shubigi, uh, who is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, artist, writer, and now artistic director of the Kochi Missouri Biennale 2021. Aside from her artistic practice investigating the pulp systems of libraries and archives, she has been very busy with the postponement and also organization of the Biennale, which was uh, postponed to the end of the year. Uh, Shubigi, welcome to the panel. The floor is yours. Thank you, David, um, and thank you to Plural Art for inviting me for this, um, and thank you all for listening. So, um, when I was asked to do this, uh, to be a part of this panel, I wasn't really sure what I had to contribute concerning cities, but it's also interesting because um, my mind immediately went to um, this idea that other people would be perhaps experts or would have their expertise that I don't have. And then I just thought of actually my artistic practice and how that's always so relevant when we think about um, urban spaces and the way we carve out um, sort of strongholds for ourselves because a lot of us do feel under siege sometimes in the city and this state of being under siege of course was, has been heightened because of COVID and I'll explain what I mean by that because it's relevant to the way also that I'm curating um, the Biennale in Kochi. Um, so when I say under siege and I use words like stronghold these are really quite um, almost antagonistic words but I think that a lot of the relationship that artists have with the space in which they live and work tends to be of that sort. 
Um, there's a fair amount of anxiety, especially in a city like Singapore or in any other comparably expensive city about um, would you actually be able to afford to live and work as an artist or a writer? Um, in, and in this case, um, just a simple example, I don't have a studio anymore. I actually can't afford a studio right now. In Yeah, yeah, I can't. So <laughs> it, I'm back to square one to a certain extent. Um, of course, this is a thing situation that a, lo a lot of people are facing, so there's nothing new here, and I really know how privileged I am despite it all. But I think this sense of never being able to actually have a space that you can live and work and inhabit in, and also think in, where you can form a routine of making, thinking, and inhabiting uh, without always feeling like you would need to renegotiate the terms of your agreement to stay there every year or every two years. That anxiety is baked into being, living, and working here. So I think when we talk about urban space and, and in particular and artists conclaves, um, we should really look at what we consider um, affordable housing for the arts. This is not only for visual artists, but also for artists who work in other disciplines. And uh, so I've heard people say, yeah, but how much space does a writer need? I'll tell you what space a writer needs. For congregation, for a communication, for working across disciplines, it is so useful to be part of an environment where there are people from multiple other disciplines in the same area. So if you're only going to have a conclave of, say, visual artists, you've really already narrowed the scope of collaboration and community. And one of the things that we don't talk about enough, I think, when we speak about um, artists and cities is also um, what forms um, our notions of community. Um, all too often I've heard this kind of rhetoric, whether it's from institutions, I've heard this rhetoric even from students that I've taught um, about how do we get an audience to like our work? How do we engage the audience? Well, you know, or rather how do you engage society or people? And I find this very strange because are we not part of society, obviously? Um, are we not already also an audience at the same time, as part of audience rather, uh, at the same time as we are makers, we're also viewers or consumers. So this, this strange demarcation is reflected in the way arts housing um, conclaves also tend to be carved out as being separate from the city. And arts districts very often don't have the space, affordable space, for artists um, again. So I think that's a problem here. An arts district is not only um, spaces of exhibition or performance, but also spaces where you can work. Now, in respect to the Kochi Missouri's Biennale, I was thinking of all these things already. There's a lot of talk about community, especially now communities of care. And I was really struck by one thing because I was an artist in the previous ed edition of the Kochi Biennale, um, and despite that, they asked me to do curate the next edition. Um, anyway, so um, in, as, as an artist, I was really struck by this because I went and stayed there to make the work. Um, because it's an artist-led, artist-initiated, and always artist-curated Biennale, there's a very strong understanding of the fact that the eventual exhibition is not the be-all and end-all. Most of the uh, commissions are produced on site. So you are working very closely with people all the time. So the, the genesis of the work may happen elsewhere, but the actual production is very often on site. None of the sites, I think barring one, are actually owned by the Biennale Foundation. They have to be leased every time. They are almost all either heritage sites or older sites. Some of them are decrepit, need to be refurbished, but by and large, almost all of them are not dedicated arts venues. The only one which is a kind of white cube space with climate control is, one, is the one that actually the fewest people go to. And a lot of it has to do also with proximity. It's you have to take a short. It's a short boat ride away. Um, it's not on Fort Kochi, but to, and it's in a very interesting space. But um, and always has fantastic work. But the problem is that because it's not in that same area, which is the island of Fort Kochi, people tend not to make that trek over there. And this is also what's interesting. Again, when we talk about arts districts or carving out space, the most the places see the most footfalls are the places which are closer to either university areas, naturally, or places where they. Uh, I'm talking about arts university or places where artists have studios or or live and work. And I think that's very telling because I think the places where you think, are, and if they if they're close by or alongside places where you work or interact with your communities, it's always a deeper and richer experience. Um, I'm pretty sure I've used up five minutes already. So have I? Yeah, I can quite easily stop now and um, go over some of the other things I had in mind a bit later, especially specifics um, if the if they come up in Q and A. Um, because I actually do have a fair bit of, of, of I, I mean, the, the stuff I did want to say, but I'll hold off on that for now. Thanks, David. Thank you, Shubhigi. I think we're off to a good start today. And I, I really liked, uh, you know, what you mentioned about how 
collaboration and community, you know, the, these notions, especially in times of COVID, how has this changed and how will we look at this differently today? Um, but we're off to a good start and I think we'll revisit a lot of these uh, concepts and notions uh, in a bit. Our next panelist is independent arts writer, researcher and curator Emma O'Neill who is the Festival Director of Art Month Sydney, uh, which saw its 2020 edition also cut short by the COVID pandemic last March. Uh, welcome, Emma. Thank you for having me. Um, it's lovely to be broadcasting all the way from Sydney. I think it exemplifies how we are pivoting in the arts world. So I'll introduce Art Month Sydney to those who aren't familiar with it. We've been, as you said, David, we've been going for about 12 years and every March we light up the city and create a stage for galleries and artists and arts workers working in Sydney. Um, and through that, we highlight the work that they do year round by creating special art gallery crawls, by creating large scale installations, by inviting people to workshop to workshops directly with artists. So in, in kind of contrast with Koichi Biennale, we are working with spaces that are there year round um, and kind of uh, activating them through a single month. So as you said, this last March, which seems both a million years ago and also two seconds ago, um, we had to cut the festival off halfway through. We were lucky that we got to kind of proceed as normal. The um, experience of COVID and the outbreak of COVID in Australia was, there was a little bit of lag um, behind um, some of our, some of our neighbors in, in the Asia Pacific. So we were able to forge ahead as normal until about, um, we called off the event about two days before all gatherings and a hard lockdown was put in place. So now we've had a year to really think about what we can do for artists and what we can do for art spaces. It, it has made our events in the broader cultural landscape even more important to those gallery spaces who have been closed for the latter half of, of 2020, for the, for the most part of 2020. Um, and we have, a real enthusiasm from those artists and real kind of innovation arising through our programming as a result of the constraints kind of brought on by COVID, whether it's from sculptures who are also creating augmented reality experiences, whether it's from curators who are pasting QR codes throughout the city to inject immersive experiences for um, for people who are limited in their goings about. Um, so we've kind of really been able to capture the spirit of um, a greater determination from those artists and arts workers ahead of the 2021 festival that is happening again in a very different form in March. Um, yeah. Did you have any more questions about, about what we do here, David? That's um, very interesting. I think it's a good start for all of us and uh, especially I think what you've mentioned, uh, really innovation arising from constraints, you know, and really a greater determination of, of everyone to 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 combat but also you know the situation but also to give everyone i think hope you know in, in the midst of very trying times uh, i think there will be definitely a lot more that we can revisit uh, and also uh, maybe back to also the organization of the event uh, in the city um, thank you so much emma um, so the next panelist that we have um, is curator, writer and director of the Yogyakarta Biennale Foundation, Alia Swastika, who has also been uh, intimately involved with many international biennales and exhibitions. Uh, Alia, over to you. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me to this panel and see all the other colleagues here. Uh, I think... I'm interested to continue what has been explored by Ms. Shubiki. I think the idea, in this situation, the idea of the space and the time also changing. 
So the way we organize Biennale is actually uh, something needs to be challenged. And I, I think this is the time where we can reflect to ourselves the way we work in our relationship between the arts and the audience. For uh, And for us, it's kind of like more than two decades after we started the Biennale. So actually, uh, the Biennale Jogja uh, this year will be held in October 2020. So it was, last year, we usually organized the festival uh, and also the symposium. And usually we started to visit the, the countries where we will invite the uh, artists from the country partners. And this year, we decided to work with artists from the Pacific region, the Pacific Islands. So uh, in our plans, uh, we would like to go to Fiji or uh, New Caledonia or all the other islands around the Pacific Islands. But yeah, it needs to be postponed and we are still working on uh, on the idea of residency because residency used to be our main platform for the exchange. So most of the time, the artists will come to Jogja or Indonesian artists will visit uh, the other countries to create the works. And then uh, we encourage them to do the collaboration when they do the exhibition in Jogja. But yet now we have to somehow uh, transforming all the residencies program into something else. But in terms of the idea on how Biennales and the, the create the creation of the space in the city and particularly in this uh, particular situation, I think in Jogja, the Biennale not only became the platform for uh, exchange of artists from other places, and it's become interesting as well because we limited the exchange only with countries coming from the equator Ireland. So in the past, we did collaboration with India, with uh, our countries like Sarja or uh, Egypt, but also we work with uh, Nigeria, Brazil, and last year edition was with Southeast Asia. So this became a very rare platform for artists and audience to connect with uh, artists from these places. So at the same time, also the Biennale become somehow uh, like the transformation of the format of the museum. Because as you know, if you are quite familiar with the infrastructure, art infrastructure in Indonesia, we don't really have what's so called as contemporary museum in Yogyakarta. So for almost two months, the Biennale become kind of like uh, playing the role of the public institution as museum. So with the COVID situation, I think that will be changing a bit. I'm thinking also to redefine the idea of the space because now we see that the wet cube or the closed buildings will be uh, replaced by, it will be more safer to use like more open space or even the places that are more connected to the community. And if you talk about the concept or the notion of city itself, Jogja is quite different because we don't really talk about cities as the rapid development of housing, residences, and buildings, but also we still live in the area where the rural situation exists. So I'm thinking also to include this more in the next Biennales uh, because uh, we will need less protocol to do less the health protocol to do exhibition in this kind of space. So either we will go to villages or uh, we use the community uh, gathering space and we will focus more on the audience around that area instead of bringing people from uh, other countries. So I think, yeah, uh, this is still the very initial plans and uh, maybe we can see the video that we, we, pre we prepare, maybe only two minutes of the start. I think it's interesting for you also to see how the Biennale Jogja actually different from other festival. Can we play the video?
Yeah. So from the short video, you can get the idea how the Biennale actually really plays where people gather. So now with the situation of the pandemic, like this notion of gathering and this notion of being together needs to be redefined. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges that we uh, that we face. But at the same time, for me, this is also very good timing for us to reflect the way we create, uh, the way we program all the festival these days. And instead of making one center or one place where everybody comes together, it will be also very helpful and I think meaningful to spread out the events in many different places in Jogja. And for the city like Jogja, with uh, the characteristic of the landscape itself, it's still possible to divide uh, all those events in different areas and communities. I think for now, yeah, that's the my introduction of what we have been planning and transforming to face the to face the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alia. Uh, I think definitely, uh, I, I love what uh, in the video says, you know, gathering and also the meeting points of friendship and creativity. Uh, and that is something that I think after one year of, you know, lockdown and being sort of, yeah, in, in our own homes and, you know, something we all miss. But also really, we have to redefine the idea of space. Uh, I, this is definitely something I want to revisit later with everyone. I think the idea of um, for very large scale events that we do, all of us do, um, the idea of decentralizing the, the event or the program and also you know in doing so uh, then being more connected to the communities that are in the spaces that we work in. Thank you Alia and we come to um, our last panelist um, Juliet, uh, Juliet Knapp, co-director of the very exciting and experimental performing arts festival of Kyoto Experiment uh, which sadly has also been impacted by the COVID pandemic. Um, I understand uh, uh, online you know post the postponement or cancelling of some of the 2021 slate of shows um, but let's hear more from Juliet over to you. Hi, firstly, uh, thanks very much for having me on the panel. It's a pleasure to join you all. Um, just to give a little bit of background about Kyoto Experiment, uh, we're an annual international performing arts festival that presents and produces experimental interdisciplinary performing arts that move freely between genres such as theatre, dance, music, visual arts and architecture. Um, so I hope I can provide on this panel some insights from a performing arts perspective um, in which I think liveness and uh, bodies gathering in a space is essential. Um, as a festival, uh, we have no permanent venue. Uh, we have a very small office in the city, but we have no permanent venue. Uh, we work together with three uh, different venues and Kyoto City itself during the festival. So in terms of cities and art, I think um, it's interesting to think about how our festival has this relationship to Kyoto City itself, um, as it's something that happens annually um, that pops up in normally the autumn each year. So in terms of that, what is our relationship to the city? Um, I hope we can uh, talk a little, I can talk a little bit more about that uh, later. Um, a little bit more about Kyoto Experiment, it started in 2010 and was founded uh, by Yusuke Hashimoto, who then directed the festival for 10 years. Uh, 2019 was the last edition that we directed, and then myself, my two day directors, uh, Yoko Kawasaki and Yuya Skahara, were then appointed as a co-director team. So it's been a challenging first year for us. <laughs> um, just to give you a Bit more of an idea of the festival, I'd like to show uh, a video from the 2019 edition of the festival.
Thank you. Um, so, as I said previously, the festival normally takes their place every autumn. So, uh, our first edition was planned for 2020 uh, October. It normally takes place over the period of a month across different venues in Kyoto. Uh, and when COVID kind of started last, uh, early last year, uh, we made the decision to postpone the festival to February, March of 2021. So the festival will start next Saturday, February 26th, and uh, it will be running for two months uh, till the end of March. Um, just to give a brief overview of our new program, I'd like to show some slides. Oh, okay. So, um, Actually, just before when David was talking about this idea of decentralization, I think um, it's kind of interesting that, and it relates to our new program that we're presenting uh, for our first edition of the festival. Um, normally at international performing arts festivals, I think you have a kind of showcase of 10 to 30, 50 performing arts works. Um, for our first edition of the festival, we decided to make three programs. So the first is Kansai Studies, uh, the second shows, and the third, Super Knowledge for the Future. Um, so I'll explain briefly a little bit about each program. So the first one, Kansai Studies. Uh, okay. Uh, for those who are not familiar, Kansai is a region in Japan uh, located in the western area of Honshu, which is the largest island in Japan. Uh, the Kansai region includes cities of Kyoto, Osaka, Nara, and Kobe. And uh, basically, this program came from um, a desire to kind of look inside to our local area and revisit Kyoto, what Kyoto means, and widely what Kyoto means in the context of Kansai. So it's a program in which we spend, at the moment, a longer period of time, about three years, working with the same artists um, and researching um, the local region. Um, and uh, we have kind of no uh, defined outcome for the process. So the process will happen over three years and we'll share the process with our audience. So that will take the form of videos, online content, exhibitions, and talks. Uh, the second program is our shows program, which is a more, uh, kind of the usual program that you might see in an international performing arts festival in which we have uh, presenting 10 works of uh, experimental performing arts, both from Japan and international work. Uh, this year, due to uh, COVID, uh, our international artist presence will be through screenings in our theatres um, or online. Uh, our Japanese artists will still be presenting their works in theatres in Japan, and the theatres of Japan are still open. Um, and then our final programme is uh, Super Knowledge for the Future, which is a series of symposiums, uh, talks, workshops on kind of various wider issues, uh, social issues, uh, that kind of link to the other two programs as well. So we've made these three kind of different programs. So we hope by setting those three kind of defined programs, we hope that the, both artists and audiences will kind of um, experiment within those frameworks and hopefully they'll influence each other uh, and we're excited to see what will happen in the future. So this festival that's coming up will kind of be a hybrid of online and live, uh, but we're very excited to see uh, how it will develop over the next two months. And um, yeah, so thanks very much for the introduction. Thank you, Juliet, and uh, congratulations uh, soon on your the opening of the festival, and I think it'll be very exciting times for, for you and the audiences there. Uh, and, and you mentioned um, the idea of, you know, the sort of hybrid model that we're all working towards, and so uh, thank you for all the questions that have been coming in. Uh, 
quite a number of questions have come in through the pigeonhole. And so, again, I remind you, please uh, submit your, your questions there. So um, I think we will, we will start with the first question that um, I coincidentally, uh, Shubhagi and I were just talking about backstage. Uh, and, and a question has come through on this. And uh, Juliet, you also mentioned this you know, hybrid model of the festival with AR, v, VR going digital. With this direction, you know, going towards yeah, AR, VR, different technologies, you know, is there a digital fatigue? Is it a necessary evil? You know, some people, quite a lot of people hate it, I think. Um, like personally, you know, I think Shibiki and I were talking about it and how it's a bit, uh, not something we quite like as well, but it seems to be the norm. It seems to be increasing. Um, and, and the first question is, you know, yeah, the person is curious about panelists thoughts on this. Um, Shibigi, can I invite you to share on your thoughts on this, which we were talking about just now, just five mm -hmm. minutes ago? Thank you. Um, I think the first thing we need to recognize is that not every form of, um, or not every media, or not every form actually functions well online or virtually. That's the first thing we have to recognize. Um, it's not always a bad thing because um, a fair number of art artistic practices have actually evolved to embrace that form of working and thinking and and that sort of distance. Um, you don't know when your work's actually released in the wild, how it's being received, you know, because it's all lopsided. There's no physical interaction with the audience anymore. Um, and that's that comes with its own situation. I think the most important thing actually is when we look at larger festivals like Biennales, the idea of taking it fully online is hard to imagine. Um, coincidentally, um, Emma, actually, I was in, um, uh, I was there for the Sydney Biennale, um, uh, uh, Brooke Andrews um, edition, and I've, actually, I, f I was one of the people who flew out last. <laughs> um, uh, just, and I think this is after Abakwad and all shut down. Um, it was actually brilliant to be there. First of all, because Brooke Andrews' vision was amazing, but also because the energy that was there, because of the focus that was there on indigenous practice and uh, and basically marginalized practices. The people who had come in there, the artists who had come in there, the thinkers, the writers, all the people who were involved with these in these spheres, um, it was a completely different energy. Later, though, when the Biennale had to be shut down because of COVID, it went online and they got a massive amount of footfalls. So I won't say it doesn't work if you go fully online. I mean, the Sydney Biennale did, and it worked so well. The, I mean, in terms of uh, sort of uh, the number of people, the kind of well, it's hard to say footfalls for an online thing, but massive numbers. And that's why when they reopened, they could do it with that confidence, knowing that people would come despite um, COVID. Um, there are, of course, other things involved there as well. And it's funny I'm talking about Sydney rather than Kochi. But I think that's a great example of how to do it well. Um, we were faced with the same thing with Kochi last year, because it was supposed to open on the 12th of December 2020. And we kept thinking, you know, we don't really have to postpone it. Um, Kerala's handling it really well. The state's handling it well. But honestly, at the same time, I was already speaking to all of the AT artists about taking their work online because we had to face the very real possibility that a lockdown could come into effect at any point. So even if you open on the 12th of December, if you're a four-month-long festival, let's be honest, during COVID, you don't know if you're going to run for four months. So we had to figure a way out for every single project, especially the new works that were being commissioned. Would they evolve into something different? Would a different iteration occur online? Could there be an extension of, its, of the physical manifestation of the work if we were to put it online? I'm not wholly in favor of an online exhibition because, first of all, you, you navigate it very differently. Also, let's be honest, digital fatigue. Everyone's exhausted. In fact, if anyone's tuning in for this, thank you. I, I can, can't tell you how appreciative I am. It's exhausting, actually, um, to just consume content online all the time. Um, so, and also, I think the experience of a Biennale, especially like the Kochi Mysterious Biennale, it's there's such a strong, um, for, those of, for those of you who may have visited it in the past, it's a, it's it's very specific to spl to that space to that place. It's the sites are amazing. They're redolent. They're rich. It's got this incredible history. The buildings are mostly heritage buildings, as I mentioned, but they're also warehouses and the places of work. And all of that is erased when you take it all online. So I do have a problem. I also think that at the same time we are privileging certain practices, which function better with AR. Um, and I think that that's a kind of flattening 
which occurs then because a number of people who don't use this natively are now forcing themselves to do it to be relevant. I'd also like to briefly point out the big issue with funding projects because globally I was just watching this happen because most of the artists are selected for the Biennale International Artists, right? Almost all of them had to depend on um, local institutional funding or such. Um, and naturally then all of that had to be deferred. And when they reapplied, they were told there was an emphasis on work that that was either digital in construction or format or presentation, which meant that a lot of them were now immediately excluded. There's an ageist comp uh, component there. There is a privileged component there. Not everyone has access to those tools. And there's a big fear for a lot of people for whom it's not native, whose practices they don't natively work online, um, that they'll come ac the work will now come across as looking Either you know you have the uncanny valley, or it just looks looks like it's done with really low um, quality tools. So I think, at the, in terms of the anxiety that is now embedded in artistic practice of showing and making um, online, but also the anxiety that now institutions are facing to have to go fully online. I think it's a two. These two things are we should really think about. Thanks, Shubigi. Um, indeed, I think. Um... Juliet, are you there as well? Uh, can we ask your experience also in yeah. the preparation and the run-up, you know, to your festival that's opening very soon? Um, you know, did, did some of the artists also sort of uh, face the same things, you know, should be just pointed out? Or what's been the experience like as, as all the your artists, you know, sort of pivot towards this hybrid um, model? <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with the fact that, you know, online isn't suitable for all artists. And, and it's it's completely... Um, insane to try and um, kind of put any work online. So um, in terms of the way we've tried to get around that at the festival um, with our international artists work that can, international artists that can no longer come to Japan, uh, we've had, we went through and discussed with each artist about all the possible options and 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 what and how we could in some way introduce their work to our audiences in Kyoto. So one of the things we've done this occasion is to screen um, archive footage of their work in the theatre. Um, so people aren't at home sitting on their laptops um, looking at the work that are gathering in the same space, which is still possible in Kyoto, gathering in the theatre uh, and watching that archive work on, on a big screen with a good sound system, which I think is really important that those bodies are sharing space and experiencing that work for the first time together. Um, with other work, for example, we have an uh, Indonesian artist, Natasha Ponti, uh, who's also has worked with video in the past and is also a visual artist. So with her work, she was meant to come to Japan and do a performance dinner um, instead uh, in an installation space. Um, instead, she's going to create the installation space um, online with with us and then uh, we'll show like screenings in the installation space. Um, so yeah, in terms of that, I think we just, and in the future as well, it's just trying to be as a festival flexible to each artist's needs and making sure that we have the tools to do online or a mixture when we can. Um, I also think in terms of even pre-pandemic before COVID happened, um, we discussed about trying to create more online content for the festival anyway. So not about putting the actual works online, but trying to create online content that the festival could produce um, that kind of showed the processes of the creation of work and also discuss the ideas uh, and themes around the work. So kind of give that context in an online format. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think definitely everyone is, you know, determined to be creative and innovative, um, to to go beyond sort of the presentation, the modes of presentation, you know, that we're used to. Um, and I, I do want to revisit this uh, comment or, or concept or thought that that was raised earlier, also. Uh, and I want to ask Emma and Alia also about this. You know, the the idea or the concept of the relationship that our events have to the city, and also the communities 
that we are, you know, located within, and also later to Juliet and Shibigi. I think the idea of the relationship to the city and, and the communities that, that we are located in is very important. Uh, Emma, can I invite you first to respond, especially say, in Sydney? Uh, and you also mentioned, I think, earlier that, you know, having the event come back on also, is, it benefits, um, you know, a whole range of different stakeholders and, and people and communities uh, when the whole, you know, month-long uh, event is happening. Absolutely. I think that all of us here, um, no one would argue with the importance of art. We are all lovers of art and we are all lovers of the, of the in real life experience because that's how we um, came to love it. So we're all pivoting to transmitting a digital experience. That isn't how we became attached to um to the culture that we work in, to the sector that we work in. In terms of the um, kind of importance of community and what art does, we all saw that when we, go in, when we go into lockdown, we all turn to art, we're all listening to podcasts, we're all tuning in, um, we're all making things that perhaps we um, you know, didn't have the breadth to do before and it now it's about translating the importance that we've learned through lockdown into our experience of the cities and I think the role of biennales and festivals is really showing cultural policy makers the value of art by injecting spirit into the city and boosting the morale of people who are traveling through it in the ways that we know how. And by selling it to them, um, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. By selling it to them, they then come back um, and give more to us to continue to expand that programming and invest more long-term in permanent um, kind of experiences of art through the city. Does that answer your question, David? Yes, it does. Thank you, Emma. And Alia, can I invite you also to respond to this question of, you know, the idea of um, city, the relationship to the city and also to the community where, uh, where the event is, is held? Yeah, thank you. I think, as I mentioned before, uh, because in Jogja, we don't really have, like, big space or... Uh, big art institutions that actually uh, have like quite well programming. So I think the Biennales and other festivals become really the core of uh, the art practice in the, as platform for artists and also for the audience. So I think uh, with the Biennale Jogja, uh, we had through many challenge and also transform into different organization throughout the time because we started the first edition was 90, 1988 so almost 32 years old so the city itself changing so i think in a way as organization and as an art event we have also to see how uh, our goal, our aim, and our programming always be relevant with the changing of the city and the community itself so uh, before, uh, until three years ago, we create every time we uh, we did the edition of the Biennale, we created also what so called as uh, Equator Festival. So instead of so this is like the complexion or the the additional uh, form of uh, art events where we use the spaces outside of the exhibition space. So we have the exhibition in the proper building, but we also always organize things that connected with community in the rural area. Because Jogja is not only city, but we have also to think about how to bring the ideas to the people who live in the villages. So usually we organize what's so called as a equator festival. And uh, last year, we postponed the festival. Uh, we didn't do the festival because uh, uh, we think 
the situation is quite different. We have already many festivals organized by the people themselves, so we don't feel like to interfere with their own festival. But with the situation now, I think it is important to bring again the, the art and the activities to the people in the village. Because now, if you compare what happened in, in the center of the city, where the government also start to limit the people movement, so like Malioboro, the, the central of the city now is almost empty. We have like half lockdown here. But in the villages, people still... Uh, have their own activities it's because in village you still have the spaces for us having physical distance for example so I think uh, it is very important also to think about the idea of the space in the interaction with community here like now uh, I organize something in the rural area and people still come like we have new audience like farmers or the people who run the market. So it's really like based on uh, the situation around the space itself. I think it is important to be consideration on how we work with artists, how to commission new works. And if we go back to the first question about how to bring this digital transformation of the art world to this uh, Biennale, I think I want to give a bit of my opinion into that. It's, if we talk about the democracy, democratization of the arts, uh, the problem is not all uh, here in Jogja or in Indonesia in general, the, inter the access to the internet is still very elite. Not everyone has the access, the same access to the internet. So that also has to be first consideration. And the second one, the technology is still very expensive. So, for example, for me as the director of a small organization that runs the Biennale, I have to think wisely how do you divide the budget between allocating your budget to the staff and artists and the volunteers that also they need the money in this situation as today and, how, and also how to allocate the budget for the technology. I think this always like two coins in the same side. You feel like technology is important, but at the same time, the humanity, like the way we uh, gather, the way we build our friendship and how to support artists and volunteers in this very particular time is always important. So I think uh, technology will not replace uh, this kind of friendship and support. So for us, uh, the idea of using technology will not be maybe putting into full online exhibition, but just more uh, some part of the exhibition or bring up documentation online through our social media instead of using all this very important, uh, very expensive technologies. Thank you, Alia. Indeed, I think the, the way we interact, engage our audiences, old, well, for not old, but existing audiences but also the new audiences is definitely changing uh, with technology or, or without as you know as people you're yeah, decentralized and going to villages and go you know spread out uh, in fact there are some uh, and there's a question here also about um, yeah having you know a huge exhibition or biennale or like public exhibits in a highly dense uh, sort of context like a city um, and how does how do such events cope with the safety concerns of this uh, maybe can I just very quickly get Juliet and then should begin to respond also back to the question of then yeah the event that you know that we, we put on uh, and to the relationship to the city and to the community as well uh, Juliet do you want to go first yeah I think uh, when me and my two co-directors Yoko and Yuya uh, were appointed co-directors last year um, that was one of the first questions that we we asked ourselves um, that was really important like um what is the point of doing a festival? What's different between a festival and, say, the role of a theatre that provides year-round programming? And um, I think with a festival that comes around annually once a year, it's about, it's not something that's that's happening kind of every day. It's something that comes along and it's a, it's kind of like a critical mass of ideas uh, and this kind of curation which which presents to the audience something that's out of the norm of the daily routine um 
the daily pace of life in a way. That doesn't necessarily mean it has to be big or fast or anything like this, but it's something that's kind of a little bit unusual in daily life. And I think that's not that's goes back to what festivals meant, I think, in a kind of perhaps in a religious way. Um, there's lots of kind of traditional festivals as well that take place in Kyoto every year. Um, so as a festival, I think we wanted to uh, present something to our audience, uh, present a platform, a space to our audience, which provided some kind of point of reflection, uh, some kind of stop in some kind of change of pace. Um, uh, at the same time, we do work with uh, theatres that provide year-round programming in Kyoto. So Rom Theatre Kyoto, where I am now, is our main venue. Uh, then Kyoto Art Centre, which does a lot of artist residencies uh, and has studio spaces. And then uh, Shinjusa, which is a theatre located inside an arts university. So they all have very different uh, contexts uh, and all provide uh, kind of year-round uh, programming. But I think for us as a festival, uh, we're smaller, we have less staff, we have a smaller budget, but at the same time, as a small ship, it's easier to move it as well. So we have the capacity to be more experimental, to be able to try new ideas, to to try new projects, to try new ways of producing works. Um, so it's kind of, I feel like, we can be a testing ground and show examples to our various part of theatre as well uh, about you know perhaps this is a new way of producing work or perhaps this is a new way but it didn't work so well this year um yeah that's i think that's kind of what we've been thinking about over the last year thank you julia i mean this is uh it's interesting you brought this up because um and before i, I so we should be you will get a sort of hybrid question the one that we were all talking about the relationship to the city but also i want to link it to another question that has come in um, questioning the very idea of, of, say, a biennale or festival, large-scale art program in such times, is this to you know is the idea totally outdated in a pandemic time? And and to me, what, what's that you know in the in such COVID times, the relationship to the city, how how has this changed and how will it change? It's very funny you say that because um, I was asked to write an essay, um, a long form essay. Um, this is pre-COVID. And one of the things I spoke about was disease. <laughs> um, I wrote about it. Um, and it's very funny. It, it wasn't prescient in a particular way, but I think a lot of artists have had this preoccupation um, for a while. I think it comes from the anxiety also because of climate change, but also the way we think about borders and the way people move. And uh, I, d I don't necessarily only mean talking about migration in the obvious way, but also the way in which we travel and in, you know, the way we consume um, um, art. And one of the things that a Biennale does, um, it's not about scale only, but it's also about duration and also the, the scope of a Biennale. Uh, even local or regional Biennales, um, in those are very troubling terms by the local and regional, I'll come back to it in a bit. Even those Biennales um, tend to be, to create their own gravity. They pull in practices that are, that are specific not only to that edition of, of, of that, Biennale or festival, but also uh, partly, I mean, curatorial vision, partly a kind of um, uh, resonance between different practices that occur when a curator travels and, and looks at work internationally. So it's a regional or a local sighting or a situation that actually draws in from multiple regions. So the first thing that gets questioned in a Biennale, especially like Kochi, which is again, as I mentioned, a very, it's regarded as a regional Biennale, something that I argue against, by the way, um, because I think the idea of region is very fraught. Localness comes with its own set of problems. So I was already thinking about this idea of what constitutes this mo this place, not just the moment. People think of a Biennale as a time-based thing. I think of it a lot also as of, and I wrote about this in the very first statement I made when I was announced as curator the um, uh, for this edition. I said Biennales can be like floating cities. They can have they can be completely unmoored from the place in which they occur. Thinking of the big ones, of course, um, but. Kochi is actually very different in that respect. It's similar to what Alia was speaking about. A city is not a wholly urban, um, disassociative experience. Okay, it's very dangerous to think like that. I think a lot of uh, what we think about when we talk about cities or biennales in cities, they pull in from 
areas that aren't normally looked at or considered when we talk about exhibition making. And I think it's really important to understand that when we're talking about areas that are semi-urban and rural, of course, but also ones that do not fit this description. For example, um, in, in Kochi, uh, one of the sort of things that does occur is that uh, um, sometimes you have people um, exhibiting there who do not even occupy the spaces that are regarded as art as part of the arts community. And um, in, the, in the previous edition curated by Anita Dubé, for instance, there was a, um, a Tuk Tuk driver's work that was in. He's actually become a breakout star, really, after that. His work is incredible. But he, picked, he used to ride a Tuk Tuk, so he's not actually part of the so-called bona fide art world. From Mumbai, which is one of the most popular cities in the world and also a center for arts production in India. But he was never part of all of that. So I think when we talk about space, we're not talking about actual physical space only. We're also talking about um, people who live and work in the same area or city, but do, are not part of that conversation, right? A Biennale can do these things. It depends a lot on the will of the curator, um, the institutional framework that build, that's, builds that Biennale, um, the foundation, in other words, the Biennale Foundation. Um, Coach is a lot like that. It looks away from the usual, and that's really, really important. And I think when I said um, that Biennales create their own gravity, um, I, what I mean is that when you get pulled into something like this, when we fly in to see a Biennale, we're coming in with our own set of assumptions about place and site and all these things, and also about the artists that we encounter. Um, but I think the conversations that occur between the different forms of work that showcase in a Biennale, you can't control it. As a curator, you should not try and control it. It is totally okay that viewers come in and uh, even no matter how jaded they are, because a fair number of us globetrotting people are very jaded about it, um, hopping from one Biennale to the other. Um, I think it's really good to also allow the jadedness to continue to occur. Biennales are still useful during a pandemic. I can't believe I'm saying this um, because I actually have always questioned the point of a Biennale um, or a large scale festival uh, just on terms of generating waste and all of these things I was thinking about because of climate change and all also resource intensive and to what end, right? Um, then I just reminded myself, part of this is a neoliberal way of thinking where we have to have tangible results for everything. That there has to be some markers of success for an event as large as this. And I, I just naturally re rebelled against that. I said, I sorry, I refuse to count the footfalls. I'm not going to give that someone else's job. I'm not really going to do that. I'm more interested in what this means for rebuilding community. In 2018, which was the previous edition of the Kochi Biennale, massive floods hit the state of Kerala and Kochi, uh, which is where the Biennale occurs. This happened three months before the opening of the Biennale. One of the communities that was severely devastated um, and a lot with fatalities and also um, livelihood completely erased was the traditional weaving community in Kochi. That is, it's and India's textile tradition is incredible. It's one of the one of the main reasons why we were colonized by the British, by the way, because that was the, our main source of wealth by the way. So Kochi has this huge history of being colonized by three different European colonizers, most of whom also came for this. I mean, it talks about spices, but it's also textile. That entire community was largely very heavily damaged by the floods. One of the things that happened was, because this occurred just before the Biennale, the Biennale rethought its stance, its position, its relevance, and reworked its 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 interaction with community. And it was less a conscious thing and more a spontaneous thing. It happened naturally. And the the forms of support that, it, that came out of it, the outpouring of support, it may have been initiated by the Biennale Foundation, but it became this whole huge thing right across the state. Um, so much so that the state come and stepped in very quickly. Um, housing was was rebuilt. Um, and even space for the looms were made. I mean, it was, it was just this incredible rebuilding effort. And it's very hard to put, again, a tangible point where you can say, oh, it was initiated by and so-and-so should get credit. Again, these are very dangerous ideas. In true community effort, um, it should not require a crisis like a pandemic or a flood. But a Biennale or a large festival, I think Alia was mentioning this as well, you at some point become so seamlessly integrated with communities um, and and um, spaces and sites and peoples in, in your environment that you can't actually de-link it. And it's, that's why I said to think of a Biennale as a floating city is a really dangerous idea. So I think the relevance is... Um, to say that, you know, is it, what's the point of, say, the Kochi Biennale? We postponed it, yes, but why still have it? Um, because of the pandemic, I'm like, because of the pandemic, we still need it. That's really what I truly believe.
Indeed, and uh, some of you who may be interested in this topic may be, uh, may be happy to know or there's, an, or there's actually a webinar later, I think as, as part of C Focus on the end of the Biennale. Uh, it's called Bye Bye Biennale. Uh, it's on later. So, um, but I think, uh, Shibigi, you, you bring up a very important point, I think, and I want, I'm going to throw this question across to everyone as well, the idea of relooking the, the, the sort of matrix of success that, that we have or the definition of success um, that large-scale events like ours always have. And this is linked to one of the questions that have come in. Uh, someone has asked, can we make a case that art appreciation is actually more meaningful now because it happens in smaller groups or in solo, you know, because of safe distancing, you have much smaller groups and, you know, people engage, small, much smaller numbers of people engage with artworks thanks to safe distancing, but also then it means, does it mean that people have more meaningful engagement with the artwork or the performance on hand? Can I open the floor to anyone or any other panelists to, to answer this? Yeah, I was, I just wanted to add, um, going back a little bit and then also uh, answering to that question, this, uh, this idea of floating cities um, is, is kind of very similar to, I think, what's happened in the performing arts world over the last 20 years, which is the, the industry is really dependent on works touring. So a work, an artist will make one work and then it needs to tour for the artist to be able to survive. Uh, and that touring happens at a very fast and high pace, um, which means you kind of get these international small international performing arts festivals which do feel like they're kind of floating in some ways above above their cities and not truly connected to the place in, in which they're presented. So when we started thinking about the first edition of Kyoto Experiment, that was really important to think about uh, what new ways uh, we could produce and present work that, that didn't rely upon that system. Of course, we're still dependent on that system because of the way funding works. Um, but that's kind of one of the reasons why we made this first program, Kansai Studies. Um, so it's smaller because it's we're working with the same artists over a longer period of time, and it's very much focused on, on Kyoto and the Kansai region. Um, it's not just Kansai artists being involved, so we're looking to involve international artists in that program as well. Um, so it's a testing ground in a way to see how we can produce work in a slower smaller kind of uh, scale and um, in terms of measures of success we deliberately uh, didn't define a goal for that program so there's an undefined goal there's a process taking place and as the process takes place we share that with our audience i we i don't know what's going to happen still <laughs> with that program so um yeah i just wanted to add that to, to the Alia, yeah, do you want to yeah. respond? I think uh, it's an interesting question also. That is also one of the challenges that we always mm -hmm. face here because Biennale usually you've got the funding, the main funding from the government, even though in Indonesia the case uh, is not very big or major funding, but still the government always push us to have all, the, all these kind of numbers as part of uh, the result measurements, like how many audiences have, or even now the question extended to the idea how much money that uh, brought up by the, by the events when you have three months duration and how much uh, money or income that related to the, the event. So this kind of uh, neoliberal measurements, as mentioned by Shubigi, I think it's become one of the things that creating challenge for us also working with the government. So it is very difficult at the same time to compete with other uh, events that because they wanted to have more visitors and then most of the events in, I don't know if it happens also in other cities or in other countries, but in Indonesia, then they try to make everything looks good on Instagram or in social media. So that is one of the most, uh, how you call it, major measurement as well. How popular your hashtag, how popular your events in the social media, 
So this become very psychological uh, pressure for the curators, for the artists as well. But uh, for us in the Biennale, uh, last year we did small exhibition coming from our other program in the foundation where we invited younger generation of artists, curators, and collectives to have classes together. And as part of the final presentation of the classes, we created small exhibition. And it was one of the quite big exhibition during the pandemic, and we were quite surprised by the response of the audience. Uh, the limitation, we only have 100 uh, people, 100 audience coming to the space every day, but most of the time they spend longer time than usual when you don't have the pandemic. And also uh, because the artists mostly present in the spaces, uh, it's only 10 days exhibition, so they, they, they can talk to the artists as well. So I think the whole intimacy or the whole idea of deeper connection in a way i agree that during the pandemic uh, this kind of usually we always think something like very fast very uh, we, we don't really have so much time to do something but with the pandemic it's kind of like the way we think about time all the time so all the artists also they have a deeper connection because it's been maybe almost a year they never display their work on site. So they told me like, oh, we really miss having uh, this kind of gathering, just display the works. And sometimes we were waiting for the lighting guy and the technicians and everything. So what was seeing as problem before was see as benefits now, because then they can spend so much time to chat and they don't really worry about the display of the work. So. The idea of the perfection was fade away for me. I can see that artists not really trying to make the works perfect anymore, but the connection with the audience and other artists become more important than the result of the artwork. I think that's also one of the things uh, that is changing. And for, uh, for me, it will be a positive encouragement for, for the young artists. So I think, yeah, uh, in a way I can tell that there are many chains that also bring you to deeper relationship and intimacy that we, we miss in the past days, in the past months. And uh, either always seeing this pandemic more like in a negative way, we can see also this is the time for us to change and transform or the idea of the, not only the aesthetic, but also the existence of the art itself. Indeed. Uh, thank you, Alia. I think uh, this goes back to a point uh, one of us uh, made earlier about the, the past year being a time for reflection. And also, I think now we can say it's a time for intimacy, um, really intimacy with the artworks, also time for reflection and intimacy for the audience as well. So we only have seven minutes left, and um, I do want to have some closing thoughts from everyone. Um, and I want to end on, on this uh, question and maybe may a bit of an elephant in the room, but really, you know, given the, I think what we are sensing now, a rather long drawn out uh, recovery time. In fact, one recent prediction in Singapore recently was that this will take four to five years for the whole world to recover from. You know, so really I want to ask every single one of you, what does the future hold? for such large-scale arts programming, you know, number one, to be held safely. How, how can we hold such events safely? But secondly, also, how can we hold such events critically? You know, to really take a critical look at the impact of, of the pandemic on people around the world, on the communities that we are located in, uh, you know, and, and really to, to see, you know, as, as Shubiki also mentioned earlier, the communities of care, um, how, how will we change the way we organize so, uh, the events that we do in the next uh, well, four to five years, given the long drawn out uh, recovery period? Uh, Emma, can I start with you to respond to that? Big question. Um, I think that we kind of, we've touched on, we've touched on it all in, in, in a real, in, a, in different ways. I think that what we will see over the next, if it is, if it's five years until we recover from all of this, I feel that 
we have to manage the labor of the art, arts workers and the artists going into these moments because we talk about both presenting um, digitally and presenting in the space. I'm currently organizing a um, curated exhibition in which artists are doing, are producing both artworks at the same time. Um, I think that that is going to, we can still present critical moments for our cities, for our arts audiences. But in five years time, we will have greater capacity and we will be able to be more agile um, more easily without putting so much strain on those artists and on our organizations. And also, you know, develop the technology that currently favors that hierarchy of works that better translate to um, to the digital realm. So I feel that the worst is behind us and I'm quite positive that as we move forward, um, we will become much better at managing it and also audiences will become um, more, uh, yes, again, that slow kind of experience that longer time with the artworks will see um, this kind of renewed value in um, visiting physical exhibitions. So that's what I see in terms of, in terms of long-term safety. We are all, you know, tuning in from very different situations. I'm tuning in from Sydney, which has had zero cases in the, le in the last 10, 10 days. And we've been very lucky here. So in terms of safety, um, it's it's not fair because we're all trying to do the same thing with very different variables. Um, so we'll and we but I think it's important these kind of panel discussions where we can all come together and converse is an important knowledge sharing because where I am now, Juliet might be in six months' time and I might be in hard lockdown. You know, I think these kind of conversations are going to be critical for people, for arts organizers, curators across the world um, to continue to create really important moments to, again, boost morale and inject spirit into the places that we are in. Oh, thank you, Emma, for that very positive um, note. And also, very quickly, we can thirty seconds per if we can. Uh, Alia, do you want to very quickly respond, and then Juliet, and then finally Shubigi? Yeah, sorry. I think I want to reflect also my practice as curator, not only as uh, organizer of the, or director of the Biennale. Also, I think that the idea of Biennale in such a scale was very much centered into the idea of curating and giving the stage for curator for such a long time. So I think this is also the time to claim how curatorial practice is actually something that is uh, more extended to our real life instead of really looking into what is happening in the art world. So uh, I think in the in the next month or in the next years, if we still organize or creating biennales or large scale even the things that we uh, usually we always set up the measurement of what is a good exhibition. But uh, I think this is now the time we ask questions again: that is it really about good or or bad, or is this really focus on the aesthetic or the the forms or format? But we think about something, something bigger, like narrating uh, or telling the stories of one uh, humanity, or narrating the stories of locality. I think then, be, then it will be more important in the practice of curating in the next years. Thank you. Thank you, Alia. Uh, Juliet, very quickly, uh, some last thoughts on this. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, yeah, I agree also with uh, with Emma as well. Like, I think it's been a time for uh, creating new tools uh, for the future. And as long as we can, hopefully the worst has gone. And as long as we can get over the worst, I think, um, yeah, there's definitely new tools and, and 
amazing conversations that have happened over the last year, which are really, really uh, positive for the future. And I think, you know, just getting over the worst of it now, and there's obviously artists who are out of work, uh, technicians and arts and cultural workers who are who are out of work as well. So um, try to, as a platform, support the people uh, closest to us and around us that are working as well. Uh, and try and get through that uh, until we can kind of, um, yeah. But I feel like we can see the light at the end of the tunnel in a way. Um, and it's, uh, we've uh, come, uh, there's been a, a journey along the way. And uh, as Emma said as well, over the last year, it's been great to be able to talk to other colleagues uh, all around the world online, like this and symposiums, various meetings and discussions, which I don't think we would have normally had the time to do. So, um, yeah, it's been amazing to see all the different responses and hear about how people have reacted in different ways in their own contexts. Um, yeah, Thank so you. thanks again for having me on this panel. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. And finally, last but not least, Shubiki. Thank you. Um, the first thing is we should recognize we're still in the middle of it, right? So we don't have the benefit of hindsight. We can't prescribe solutions and no one size solution fits all. It's very easy to say, let's be flexible. There's an opportunity and all of that. But I think the first thing we should do is look for people who need support. Who are the people who need support and need care? Emma's already spoken about art workers. has been reiterated by the other panelists, so I won't rehash that, because, it, but it's really important. So that's the first thing. If you want to talk about longevity of institutions, biennales or anything, if the people don't make it through this pandemic, then what's the point? So that's the first thing I'm, I, I really feel very quickly. The second thing is, I think maybe it sounds very idealistic, but I think we, a lot of us do live and die by ideals. Um, as humans, we will always make, think, create, and also look for people with whom we can share these things. That's not going to stop just because of a pandemic and because we are physically isolated from each other or socially isolated. We'll always find a way to do it. Some of us are biding our time, yes, and just weathering it. But um, a lot of us are also still using this as a, as, um, a motivator or an imperative from which we feel the urgency to act even more. We can see it in hopeful regime changes. But we can also see it in, at, at, I mean, at that political level, but we can also see it at institutional levels, also at grassroots levels. So it's happening all around us. We really need to look at the examples and look for the people who are doing this and also try and find ways in which we can, in our own way, articulate the forms of care that we really should be doing. So um, I think I'll end with that, but also just quickly, um, such a joy to meet you, Emma, um, Juliet, and Alia. I wish we could have met in person, but but um, this will have to do for now. Thank you, Shubigi. We will always find a way to do it. That's, I think, the, the nothing else we can really talk about. And that's the best way to end this panel. Thank you so much uh, to all our panelists and also you, the audience. Uh, thank you for the questions. And uh, yeah, thank you, everyone. And have a good rest of the Singapore Art Week. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, Juliet, Shubigi, Alia, and David, for that fascinating session. This takes us to the end of today's program. We hope you had a great time, regardless of whether you're here with us at Victoria Theatre or if you're tuning in remotely. For audience members at Victoria Theatre, please wait to be ushered out of your seats. Um, last thing, on the slide right now, you will also see the URL and QR code for a survey on your Singapore Art Week experience. Um, participating in the survey entitles you to a lucky draw with some very attractive prizes. So we hope you will uh, participate. We hope to see you all again here tomorrow. Many thanks and goodbye.